Hi, welcome to another episode of Mike's Collection. I'm Mike, and the part of my collection that I'm going to be talking about today is the G.I. Joe Collectors Club 2017 Convention Box Set. So the G.I. Joe Collectors Club has been uh, holding the official G.I. Joe conventions for over 20 years, and beginning in 2002, um, they started releasing these exclusive box sets of 15 figures, which were available at the show, and some of the sets were also available online uh, for non-attendees like myself. I've never been to a, a G.I. Joe convention, but I have purchased the sets uh, the last few years. So I have all the sets from, uh, from 2012 up to 2018. I wish I'd gotten that 2011 set because it's pretty expensive to buy now, and I probably won't ever get it. But uh, I'm glad I picked up all the ones that I did. Every year I hummed and hawed about buying it because they were expensive sets. And uh, yeah, it wasn't an easy decision to put like 600 Canadian dollars aside to buy a set of G.I. Joe's. But uh, the figure, the sets always have at least two or three or four like really popular characters that end up selling for, you know, over 100 bucks a piece on the secondary market. So even if I hadn't bought the set, I would have ended up buying probably the three or four popular characters and been paying almost just as much. So I kind of learned early on, just buy the set. So tonight I'm going to take a look at the, uh, the 2017 set. Uh, and the reason I decided to start there is because it is kind of late when I'm recording this. And I thought uh, that one would probably be the quickest one to review because there was fewer uh, unique figures in that set to talk about. Although uh, once I started pulling out all the figures... I realized there actually still was a fair amount of figures for me to talk about, so I'll try and move relatively quickly. So here is the box. So this is what we get every year. Um, you'll see here that the 2017 set was called Force of Battle 2000, and it features the members of Battle Force 2000. So Battle Force 2000 is G.I. Joe's kind of like high-tech unit of futuristic fighters. They were originally introduced into the vintage toy line in 1987. So there was the six members of Battle Force 2000. Um, they were available in two packs together and each of them uh, piloted their own unique vehicle. And all the vehicles, if you purchase them all, they could be put together to create the uh, future fortress headquarters for Battle Force 2000. Now me and my brother Doug, we collected um, G.I. Joe's together, just like we collected all vintage toys together. So when it came to these two packs, we split each one up. So I only have three of these vintage characters, which I'll show you when I get into the figures, but I don't have the other three because my brother Doug has all those. But uh, we never had any of the vehicles, um, partly because we were really much more into the figures and the vehicles. And typically we only bought a vehicle if it had a cool figure with it that we wanted. So we were glad that these figures were available separate from their vehicles because it saved us the trouble of collecting all of them. And even though it was kind of a neat idea that they snapped together to make a headquarters, uh, apparently they weren't as, uh, as spectacular as they sound because they didn't actually snap together. You just kind of rested them next to each other and it was apparently fairly underwhelming. So, so yeah, so they brought back Battle Force 2000 for this box set. It's the first time that we've seen pretty much all these characters since the original 1987 figures. Um, and they're not necessarily a fan favorite set. I think they're kind of a, you know, a niche favorite amongst the collector community. Partly because some G.I. Joe collectors are pretty hardcore into just the military aspect. So when they bring in weird future fighters and monsters and stuff, that turns some people off. Uh, I was pretty young when I was collecting G.I. Joe in the 80s, so I was all for like this kind of weird and wonderful stuff. And yeah, I was a big fan of Battle Force 2000. And uh, I was worried that we weren't going to see them because I think it was probably around 2016 that we first learned that the Collector's Club was about to uh, lose the license to produce new G.I. Joes. And so it was winding down, and it didn't seem like we were going to get Battle Force 2000 because Hasbro wasn't going to release these on their own obviously and uh, so we were really hoping the club would and fortunately the club got an extension on its contract by a couple extra years and they managed to get these figures to us so I know I was really excited about it however the set is uh it does have its flaws which we'll get into in a moment so I'll just quickly pop this open and show you what we get inside 
So this is what the inside of the case looks like. So it's got this nice uh, kind of custom foam so you can store all your figures in there. You could probably tack this up to a wall somewhere, display all your figures nicely like that. Every year there was a little pin representing uh, the city where the convention was held. Um, this particular year we got a secondary pin as well. Um, they always come with a certificate of authenticity. There's always an exclusive comic book in the set, as well as a whole bunch of accessories, which you can usually just find kind of hidden behind the foam in the back of the box. So, yeah. So now let's take a look at the figures that were in here. So the first figure we're going to look at is Maverick. And this is Maverick version 2. This is version 1 from 87. And these are the only two versions of Maverick that we've ever gotten. And uh, so Maverick was the Vector Pilot. That was the name of his kind of futuristic jet. And uh, Maverick was my favorite member of Battle Force 2000 when I was a kid. I really liked this figure. Kind of a pretty simple sci-fi look to him. And I really liked his, uh, his helmet, which was removable. So there you can see Maverick underneath. And yeah, and the helmet fits him quite well. So yeah, I was really excited to see what they would do with Maverick. And looking at this figure, you can see that there's definitely some differences. But I, I still think he came out pretty successfully. So, here he is. So the colors are definitely right on. So they match uh, almost exactly with the silver, the white, the kind of olive drab green, and the blue. Now underneath his helmet, he's got a pretty, uh, you know, pretty standard face. Nothing really too interesting about it. And so this was not a uh, a new piece. Sometimes the club made new parts for their convention set. They didn't make one for Maverick. His head is actually just a reuse of another GI Joe pilot's head. So this is Ace, and this head appeared on a couple different versions of Ace. So you can see there that those are the same. And I'm fine with that. Considering that Maverick is the type of figure that, uh, you know, I know I'm going to display him always with his helmet on. So, you know, it wouldn't make much sense for the club to spend a lot of money uh, making up a new head sculpt for him. But what I wish they had done is created a new helmet. So this helmet, you know, it's cool and it fits him pretty well, but it is a reused part as well. Um, I think it was available on a couple of different figures. The first time we saw it was during the, uh, the Rise of Cobra movie line. I think it might have came on a pilot uh, Firefly or something. Anyway, it just doesn't look like Maverick to me. I feel Maverick had a pretty unique looking helmet. And so while it's definitely kind of, you know, it, you can tell this is supposed to be Maverick. I wish the helmet was more accurate to the, the vintage style. Now, as for his gear, he borrows a lot of his parts and his, uh, his web gear there from this figure. Now, this is a pretty neat figure if you haven't seen it before. This was a G.I. Joe figure produced by Hasbro that was uh, supposed to be Matt Tracker from a totally different toy line called Mask. And uh, so it's a kind of an underused Hasbro property that they, um, yeah, they just kind of snuck this character into the G.I. Joe line, which is pretty cool. But you can see here that like the legs, at least the upper legs, and the, uh, the removable kind of web gear here with this kind of V logo on the front, that's all borrowed from Matt Tracker. So, yeah. As far as him, Maverick being my favorite, um, I don't think he's my favorite from this set. Um, partly just because there's no new parts to him. Uh, the helmet doesn't fit as snug as the vintage one, so it tends to kind of rattle around. He's a cool figure and a decent update. And again, with any of these guys, I'm just really glad that we got modern era versions of them. But I definitely think Maverick could have been better. So next up, we'll take a look at Blaster. So this is Blaster version 2. The only other version of this character that we've ever gotten is the 1987 original. Now I don't have the original one here because that's one of the figures that my brother Doug owned when we were kids. And even though I have picked up a lot of vintage G.I. Joes in the years since, uh, I haven't got any of the Battle Force 2000 guys that my brother had. So... I must admit, I have kind of a preference towards the three characters that I had, as opposed to the three that Doug had. But uh, 
But I really think that uh, Blaster is one of the nicer figures from this convention set. I really like the look of this guy. So his body is made up of all uh, existing parts, but they come together really well. And he's got a brand new head sculpt, which uh, I like quite a lot. And it definitely looks like Blaster. Now again, it would be better if I had the old figure here to compare to to see just how different it is. But uh, yeah, I just I think it looks great. And I should have mentioned, as far as accessories go, um, each of these Battle Force 2000 guys came with a green display base, which is unique to their sub-team. So they definitely, when you see them standing on a shelf together, you can tell that they're all supposed to be together. And each of these guys all came with uh, like two weapons. Some of them I have displayed holding both of them. Uh, some of them I've only got one. Because each member of Battle Force 2000 kind of had a unique, somewhat futuristic weapon. Um, so the club did spend some of their tooling dollars recreating all of those vintage weapons for this set. Now, when it comes to Blaster here, I don't know if this was his unique weapon or if this was just kind of his standard rifle. Um, because some of them I have tucked away in my parts bin and I didn't bother to dig them out for this, uh, for this review. But it was cool that uh, the club did recreate all their weapons anyway. So now every time the club gives us a unique head sculpt, it makes sense that they try and reuse it again, get the most bang for their buck. So we saw this head reused again the following year um, for G.I. Joe pilot Ghost Rider. And now he's got some goggles on his helmet, which kind of helps. So he doesn't look exactly like Blaster here. But it makes sense for Ghost Rider, so it works. But yeah, overall, I was just really pleased with this figure. So next up we have Avalanche, and he was the Dominator driver. And he's also the cold weather specialist of Battle Force 2000. So you can see here that he's one of the ones that I had the vintage version as a kid. And I liked this guy. Like looking at him now, I don't know why I did really. Like he's pretty goofy looking. But this is Avalanche. And... Uh, I was a fan, and I was looking forward to see what his update would look like. And as you can see, he's pretty accurate to the vintage figure, and I think he turned out quite well. Now you'll also see, this is what I'm talking about with the two weapons. So he's got this kind of standard rifle, cast in white, but this here uh, is kind of his weird, unique, I don't know, like laser weapon, whatever you'd want to call it. So that's what he would have had in the vintage line. And the club has recreated it here. So yeah, he's got his silver like knee-high boots. He's got kind of his interesting white and brown camouflage. And his helmet, um, it's not quite the same here. So this, again, was a brand new head sculpt, like Blaster. The, uh, the club made this head brand new for this figure. So you kind of figure, well, if they're making a brand new head, why not make it look as accurate as possible? But uh, like with any of these figures, the club is trying to get the most value for their uh, tooling dollars. So I think when they're making these heads, they're already thinking about how they can use it next. And uh, like Blaster, they use it again the following year for this character, Windmill. So this head works for Windmill. His original head was similar to this. So I think they kind of took the best of both and kind of gave us a bit of a hybrid so that it would work for both characters. Now the thing I do find interesting with this head sculpt, which I do quite like, but I really think he looks like Kevin Spacey. But anyway, I like pretty much everything about this figure. He's a cool update. I'm kind of a weird favorite of mine from when I was a kid. Yeah, I think he was uh, quite successful. So that's Avalanche version 2. Now this here is Blocker. This was the Eliminator driver. And this is version 2. The only other version of this character we got was the 87 original. And this was another character that Doug had the original of, so I don't have the vintage figure here to show you. But from what I can recall, this is pretty accurate to the vintage figure. He had uh, like a similar shaped kind of hat and the camo the deco definitely looks right and uh, yeah so again i would say this is a pretty pretty successful redo of blocker 
Um, the biggest issue I have with this figure is uh, he's got a brand new head sculpt, again, which is nice, but he has no eyebrows painted on. And I don't know why they, I assume that was just a mistake, but he definitely looks kind of odd with no eyebrows. But, um, so anytime the club makes a new head, they want to reuse it. So when it comes to Blocker, they reused it the following year for Rampart. And the fact that they gave Rampart some additional goggles kind of helps to differentiate these characters. But uh, I think it works pretty well for both. I think Rampart's the more successful figure. Uh, he does, you can kind of see it through his goggles there, but he has eyebrows, so he wins out in that regard. But, uh, yeah. So, Blocker's okay. Um, but due to the lack of eyebrows, and due to the way the build they use for his feet, you see he's got these kind of pads at the front, which kind of make him lean backwards. It makes, him, makes it difficult for him to stand up straight. Those two problems kind of knock him down a few pegs. So, yeah. There's Blocker. Not my favorite figure from the set, but not bad. So, this here is Knockdown version 2. So this was another character that I had when I was a kid. So here's my vintage Knockdown. Now Knockdown's kind of most recognizable feature was his kind of crazy helmet, which I actually never had. Uh, I think I might have bought this guy secondhand and I don't have any of his accessories. So I don't have his helmet or his unique weapon. So I always liked this figure, but he's, uh, you know, kind of dull. He was my least favorite of the three compared to Maverick and Avalanche. And the club here has created him relatively successfully. You can see um, kind of color-wise that they match up pretty closely. And uh, this would be a recreation of his vintage gun, I guess. And the helmet here, it's uh, kind of similar in style to the vintage helmet. But this is actually a reused part from uh, General Mayhem, which was a character the club made for one of their convention sets a couple years earlier. But the helmet pops off. And there's his head sculpt. Now it is not a unique head. It's actually a reuse of this figure here. This is Quinn the Eskimo, who was a character that was really popular in the, in the comic books. And we didn't get any figures of him for a really long time. So he's kind of a, a fan favorite. So it's kind of a different choice with the change in hair color and the change in skin tone. They're not immediately recognizable as the same, same head. So I think that works out pretty successfully. And even the vintage uh, Knockdown didn't have an original head, so not a big deal there. Um, this vest that they used, it's kind of got the angular shoulders. It kind of matches up with that pretty well. Um, the boot there, he's got that kind of green piping on the boot. It's not quite accurate because he's got multiple kind of pipes on his boots there, but, you know, it's close enough in style. The uh, weakest part of this figure is this weird decal they gave on the front because you can see here he has sculpted these three uh kind of like i don't know gas tanks or something on the front of his vest and i guess there was no figures in the modern era that really had that look so the club just used this flat vest and then painted the canisters on which is not something that we really ever saw before and looks pretty silly because it does just look like that's a logo on his shirt you know i don't think that's very believable as three canisters so uh yeah i think maybe they should have just left that off altogether but uh it's not a deal breaker so yeah knock down here he was the sky sweeper driver and yeah this is version two so other than this uh this original one here that's the only version of knockdown we've ever had and he came out all right so the last member of battle force 2000 that we have to look at is dodger and this is another one of the figures that my brother had when we were kids. So I don't have the vintage figure here to show you. But I think he turned out really well. And he's quite accurate to the vintage figure. So yeah, along with, uh, with Blaster, I think this may be probably the most successful figure from the set. I like it a lot. With a cool uh, shotgun there. He's kind of got that uh, Marine from Aliens look, and I don't think that's a coincidence. Since he's supposed to be a futuristic soldier, I wouldn't be surprised if his design was kind of inspired by that Marine. 
from the future. Now, uh, this was a brand new head sculpt for Dodger. And just like all the other uh, new head sculpts, it was reused the year following. So we got it on bulletproof here. So they look different enough, partly because of the skin tone. And you might have heard, this is actually Dodger version 3. So of all the other members of Battle Force 2000, they got their 1987 original figures, and then that was it. Now, with Dodger, there was the 87 original, but then he got repainted in 1990, and he was a member of the Sonic Fighters. Now, I don't have that vintage figure either, but the club, uh, in their final 12 figures that they released before shutting down, they repainted this figure in his Sonic Fighter colors. So here is version 3 and version 4 of Dodger. And just an interesting little bit of trivia about Dodger is, uh, so in the old days, every time Hasbro created a new character, Larry Hama, who wrote the, who wrote the vintage Marvel comic books, was always kind of supposed to work these new characters, new vehicles into the comic book to, you know, to get people to want to buy these toys. So Battle Force 2000 made their first appearance in uh, issue 68 of the G.I. Joe comic book. Um, but once these toys were no longer being circulated and Battle Force 2000 was kind of, you know, done and over with, Hasbro gave Larry Hama permission to kill them off. And he did. He killed off the whole team in issue 113, except for Dodger. He's the only guy that lived. And I'm assuming that's because they said, well, we are going to reuse that character for the Sonic Fighters line, so we don't want him to die off. Um, that might have been a chicken and egg situation, maybe because he's the only character Larry kept alive. Hasbro decided to make him a member of Sonic Fighters, but I'd say it's probably the other way around. When they told him to kill off the characters, they said, keep this guy. So there you go. That's a Dodger. Pretty cool figure. So generally with any of the convention box sets, the, the club includes two factions. So that would usually be, say, G.I. Joe and Cobra. But they have used some of the other factions like uh, the Iron Grenadiers and the October Guard. So you want some good guys and some bad guys. So Battle Force 2000 was the good guy side of things for the 2017 set. So now let's take a look at the bad guys. So this here is the Cobra Bat. And you'll see on his display base, they call him uh, version 1.8. So Cobra Bat, these are the battle android troopers. And the original Bat looked like this. And so this was the modern era update to the original uh, 1985 Bat. And he came out great. I think the Bat is one of the better modern era figures ever produced. And we got all kinds of variations of the Cobra Bat. So I'll show you just a few of them. But here he is with the red face, which is a little more accurate to the cartoons. Here he is. This is the Nano Bat. Here's like the Arctic Bat. Um, and yeah, so you get the idea. I probably have about 10 different variations of Bat version 1. So in the vintage toy line, um, the second version of the Bat came out in uh, 1991. Yeah, the original was 86, version 2 was 91, and the 91 version was pretty much an entirely new sculpt. It was very similar. It still had kind of this like crest on the front, and he had this uh, interchangeable limbs, and so he's similar in design, but he was a whole new figure. And the heads looked like this. So again, you can see how they're kind of similar. This one has kind of the full visor, but this one here, the visor takes up the, you know, the whole front of the head. It's much larger. So rather than call this an update to Bat version 2, because um, all the club did is they took this figure. Let me get these guys out of the way. So they took the Bat version 1 figure and plopped a Bat version 2 head on him. But otherwise, you'll see the body is exactly the same. So like the boots are the same. The holster on the leg is the same. The arms are the same. You know, they got the same backpack. 
So because it's got the original body with just the replaced head, they called them version 1.8. And they even kind of came up with a storyline saying that this type of bat was created in between version 1 and the 1991 version 2 that I don't have to show you here. So he was kind of a, a middle step there. So I don't think the club necessarily needed to go that far to come up with, uh, you know, a storyline. I don't think anybody would have really questioned it, but I guess it's a nice little step that they made. So yeah, this is bat version 1.8, which is technically the 24th version of the bat we had when you count all the vintage ones and all the variations of, of this guy. So these convention sets, whenever they include kind of a standard trooper like this, they usually give us multiples, which a lot of fans appreciate because when you get a trooper like this, you want to have a couple of them so you can have a whole squad. So in past year sets, what they've done is they've given us, um, they come in groups of three. So maybe we'll get two different trooper types and we'll get three of each of them. Um, but for this year, so they gave us the six Battle Force 2000 guys and then they gave us some variations of the bat and you'll see I've got them displayed I tried to have every one of these unique so he's got his sword hand on here while this guy's got his like drill hand on and you can change you can see on the backpacks there's some of the extra pieces they have the drill the flamethrower or the extra fist because you can change out either one of their hands so there's another one and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one, and another one. So there you go. We got eight identical figures in this set, which is not very cool. Partly because, like, the bat is a great figure, and I would have been happy to get three of these that were identical. But what they could have maybe done is then give us, even if these were the exact same figure, maybe if these guys were just had yellow instead of orange, uh, and then these guys could have had blue instead of orange, just change them up a little bit. Say these guys are infantry and these guys are vehicle drivers or something. You know, you, they wouldn't have had to spend a lot of money, but this set, like I said, costs about 600 bucks or so once you factor in the exchange rate uh, and the shipping and the customs. Um, and maybe even more than that. So when I'm spending that much money on a box set of figures, it kind of sucks to get eight identical figures. And the bat, even though it's a fan favorite figure, as I said, we've already gotten like probably over a dozen variations of the bat already. So it's not like a character that we really needed a whole squad of because we had so many of them. So it was kind of disappointing and I could understand that a lot of people might not have wanted to shell out the money for this set because it's hard to justify with eight identical figures. So with the eight bats and the six members of Battle Force 2000, that still leaves one slot open. And when the set was first announced, the 15th figure was advertised as the Bat Squad Leader. So most Joe fans assumed that that was going to be Overkill because Overkill is the, uh, the leader of the bats. He's kind of a cyborg dude. Um, and so that's kind of what we were expecting. But we quickly learned that's not what we were going to get. And what we ended up with... Let's move these guys out of here. So the bat squad leader is this guy. So again, it's the exact same figure. He's got a different weapon there. Um, but yeah, he's in red instead of orange. And that's it. So again, it seems like the club really kind of cheaped out here. Like they did give us a few new heads on the Battle Force 2000 characters. And this is a new head too, technically, because it is different from the other bat. So there were about four or five new heads in the set, which does cost money. But then to give us this many versions of the one character, 
uh, yeah, it just seems like they were definitely cutting some corners. And as I mentioned before, I wouldn't even care if they didn't if they called this guy not a squad leader. But if they gave us three orange, three red, three yellow, um, that would be more justified to me and just give us some reason for that. Um, but yeah, this is a whole lot of bats. And luckily it is a cool figure. I dig the look of this guy. And the fact that he has the swappable limbs. So no two of these guys are displayed the same. You know, I might have, you know, like this guy here. He's got two claws. Um, so you do have some, uh, some options within this set. But yeah, that's a big flaw for this 2017 set. Is just too many bats, not enough variations. So yeah, that's it for the convention box set. But next up, I want to take a look at some of the figures that were available at the convention, but weren't included in the set. So yeah, let's take a look at those. So the next bunch of figures I'm gonna show you, these were all for sale at the convention, but they weren't announced in advance. So the box set, they announced that um, maybe a couple of months in advance of the show, and that gives people an opportunity to order the, the non-attendee set, which is what I've done. But when it comes to figures like this, you don't know in advance. Uh, the club does not sell them online. So the only way that I was able to get these figures was to buy them uh, on eBay from somebody that actually attended the con. So first up, we'll take a look at DJ. So after 1987, there was only one new member of Battle Force 2000. Uh, and that was DJ, who was released two years later in 1989. So here is my vintage DJ figure. Now, unlike every other member of Battle Force 2000, he did not have his own vehicle to add to the, uh, the future fortress, which is uh, too bad for DJ, I guess. And poor DJ here, since he was introduced two years later, his first appearance in the comic books was that very issue where he got killed with the rest of the team. So I'm very glad we got him. I would have been very disappointed if they'd put out this box set and not made uh, DJ available. Because when they announced the figures that were going to be in the box set, I was kind of surprised DJ wasn't there. So I was really hoping that he would be added as an as a like a separate figure available at the set. So uh, at the con, and I was very glad that he was because yeah, I actually really didn't like the DJ figure when I was a kid, but uh, he's kind of grown on me as a character over the years, and it just would have seemed a crime to have one member of a seven member team left out. So you can see here with this figure, they've updated him fairly well. He definitely looks like DJ. He has a brand new head sculpt here. Um, so it matches up very nicely with the vintage one. And DJ, the vintage DJ had a pretty memorable backpack here. And he was the, uh, like the communications radio telephone operator trooper. So they didn't recreate that backpack, but they did just give him a Dial Tones backpack, which works pretty well because it's still a communications pack, and it's got this kind of antenna device on there, which kind of replaces the antenna that used to attach to his helmet. And also you can see here, that was DJ's unique weapon, and we've got that here uh, molded in white this time. And he's got the green display base, so he matches the rest of the members of his team. And yeah, so DJ came out pretty well. So he was available at this at the con in a just in a bag. He wasn't in a box or on a card or anything like that. And he was in a pack called Ultimate Enemies. And he was packaged with this figure here, who's a Cobra character who they've named Corrosion. And this is Corrosion version one. So we've never got this character before in the vintage G.I. Joe line. But what he is, is uh, there was a Brazilian repaint of DJ uh, back in the vintage line. It was only available in Brazil, and he was painted with these bright colors, and he was part of the Eco Force. And he was a member of Cobra, and his name was Caroso, or something along those lines. So it's kind of a neat nod to the foreign figures that the club repainted their DJ and turned him into Corrosion. And... Uh, yeah, is quite successful. I appreciate that even though he's largely made up of the same parts, so they use that brand new head on him, 
they did go so far as to change up the vests. So the vests are different here, so he's not completely identical. And he had different weapons with him as well. You'll see he's got his kind of grenade launcher gun there. Anyway, I thought this was a really neat set. And uh, the day of the convention, this was kind of leaked out as people that were at the con were posting pictures of it. And I immediately went to eBay and uh, picked myself up a set. So I was pretty excited to get both of these guys. So this is Backstop version 2. He is based on the 1987 original figure. Now, other than the fact that he was released the same year as the original Battle Force 2000, and he actually did appear in uh, issue 68 along with them in their first appearance, he really doesn't have any ties to Battle Force 2000. So he's kind of an odd choice as he's the only uh, Joe figure available at the 2017 convention that wasn't related to Battle Force 2000. But he is still a, uh, a vintage character that we did not have updated in the modern line, so... We're happy to get him. So uh, he was a tank driver in the vintage line. So it's kind of an odd choice that they selected him for the parachute drop figure this year. Every year at the con, they go up to the roof of the building and they throw a bunch of figures down on actual parachutes. And they float down to the ground and kids and stuff can claim them. So backed up here. That's why he's hooked up with this parachute rig. And uh, yeah. So that's backstop. Kind of an odd choice, again, to have a tank driver be a parachute figure. But again, I don't really care about any of that. I'm just happy to get a new character. And his head there is a reuse of a convention figure uh, the year before. So this is static line. And uh, people pretty much knew as soon as static line came out that that head was going to be reused for backstop. And it works out quite well. And again, the fact that they're due to their different races, um, the heads work pretty well together. It doesn't just look like a clone of the same character. So yeah, I like both of these figures quite a bit. At most of the conventions, the club usually has a Trooper Builder 3-pack available. So you can get three different uh, identical Troopers in one bag. So that way you can create a little squadron there. And in 2017... It was the Laser Viper. So you could get three of these identical figures here. And since he's a Laser Viper, he's got Sci-Fi's Laser Pack here as his weapon. And uh, this is a pretty cool uh, recreation of the original uh, 1990 Laser Viper. He's got his kind of signature helmet there. And just kind of a ski mask underneath. Which is accurate to the vintage figure. And yeah, I think he turned out pretty great. And the last figure from the uh, 2017 con is the Laser Viper Officer. So, same figure, just done in different colors. This is based on a 2001 uh, Laser Viper figure. Now, that Laser Viper from 2001 really just had the Laser Viper name. He didn't have the signature helmet and look. But the club here has taken that 2001 figure and put it on a kind of classic looking laser viper and created a unique character there. And uh, this laser viper officer was included with a vehicle, which was the uh, Cobra Sky Serpent, which was a repaint of the Black Dragon. Now, uh, like I said, I only really buy vehicles if I need to get a cool figure, and I really thought this was a cool figure, so I did have to buy the vehicle, and you will see it uh, right there that blue uh, kind of helicopter jet. So the biggest gripe about these guys is that the classic Laser Viper had a Laser Viper pack with two laser guns that came over his shoulders and they weren't included with these figures and people were disappointed. Now the following year we did get another version of the Laser Viper, the Python Laser Viper and he did have the classic laser viper pack so you see there it's got the two laser beams and then he's got kind of this handle attachment that he can reach on to so it's kind of a shame we didn't get these lasers with these two laser vipers but the club actually did release this pack in uh it's like blue or gray uh intended for this three pack 
So if you were really intent on having backpacks for these figures, the club did hook you up a year later, but you had to pay for them separately. I didn't bother with that. But uh, yeah, the Laser Viper is a cool trooper, and it's nice to have three different versions of him here now. And there you go. Those are the final figures from the 2017 convention. Okay, so that's my review of the 2017 Jocon box set, as well as the additional convention figures. I hope you enjoyed the video. Uh, I probably will do similar videos for all the other sets that I have. So if you liked it, please hit the like button. If you have any questions or comments, please do so below. And please subscribe to my channel. Anyway, it's like 2 in the morning now, so I gotta get to bed. So I'll see you next time.